Good day and welcome once again to Cato Surveillance Week 2023. Um, our topic today is surveillance reform prospects and we're going to be joined by an absolutely outstanding panel uh, of experts today. And I'm going to uh, introduce them in just a few seconds. Okay. And welcome once again to Cato Surveillance Week 2023. Um, our topic today is surveillance reform prospects. And we're going to be joined by an absolutely outstanding panel uh, of experts today. And I'm going to uh, introduce them in just a few seconds. Okay. And welcome once again to Cato Surveillance Week 2023. Um, our topic today is surveillance reform prospects. We'll We'll be and with you be in just a few and seconds. And we appear to be having some technical issues. Please stand by. And I'm going to uh, introduce them in just a time we were having a little bit of a of a technical issue here uh we're going to be discussing today essentially uh during the course of uh 2023 what kind of prospects there are for actually reforming some of these uh surveillance authorities that have been in so much in the news over the course of time we were having a little last bit of a, minute, of a technical issue here uh we're going to be discussing today essentially uh during the course of I apologize. Uh, I think we're still having a little bit of a technical what issue here. Please stand by. There are for actually for already got several questions actually queued up here, so I'm very pleased with that. Let me turn now to just very quickly introduce uh, our very distinguished uh, panel today. Joining us from 
Uh, the Brennan Center is Liza Gotian. She is the senior director of the program at the Brennan Center. We're also joined by Jake LaPeruk, who is the deputy director of the Security and Surveillance Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, and finally, we are joined by the former chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, Representative Bob Goodlatte of Virginia, and he is currently the senior policy advisor at the Project on Privacy and Surveillance uh, Accountability. Um, I want to just make a few opening remarks here uh, with respect to uh, kind of how we got here uh, and, and why this discussion is so important. I think it's important to remind everyone that the 9-11 attacks did not happen because our government had failed to collect the data necessary to stop them. In fact, it had collected the necessary data and intelligence. And that was something that the subsequent Congressional Joint Inquiry in 2002 and ultimately the 9-11 Commission in 2004 uh, both proved through their own investigations. So a key question that I think we need to tackle today is simply this, how did we get to a place where we ended up with these expansive surveillance authorities when we know our government could have stopped the 9-11 attacks long before these authorities were even created. To address that question, um, I wanna start with the Patriot Act, which was enacted in late 2001, late October of 2001 specifically, uh, just six weeks after the 9-11 attacks. And, and my opening question goes to you, Bob Goodlatte. Give us a sense of the mood in the House as the Patriot Act was essentially being discussed, debated, and in the end, what what kind of compelled you to go ahead and support the legislation? Sure. Well, I think the uh, fact of the matter is it was a very dramatic uh, period of time uh, in our nation's history. This attack was unprecedented uh, in terms of being a terrorist attack. There were more casualties than uh, at Pearl Harbor. There were, uh, I think, not since the Civil War, uh, American people seeing an attack of this nature. Uh, there were reports that uh, government agencies did not know what other government agencies knew. So that, for example, the FBI may not have known information that the CIA or the NSA held. Uh, so there's a belief that there was a stovepiping uh, of information held and that therefore something needed to be done to correct that. Now, the Patriot Act uh, was a massive bill. It had uh, uh, hundreds of provisions. And so... Uh, to uh, uh, answer the question about why I voted for it, I think virtually, uh, I'm not sure every member voted for it, but almost every member of Congress voted for it to address uh, what was felt to be an immediate concern to prevent a similar attack from happening. This was such a surprise to not only the American people as a whole, but their elected representatives that they felt that measures needed to be taken to make sure that information was uh, being used properly, uh, whether or not uh, <clears throat> there was an argument made that we didn't have sufficient information, uh, I don't recall that. What I recall was the information wasn't being shared where it needed to be shared. Uh, but in any event, um, there's no question that it triggered um, a, I think, overreaction. And I think that like a lot of uh, different uh, organizations, I think law enforcement and the intelligence community definitely operate on the theory that you never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and I believe that uh, at any given time, they have a, uh, a shelf uh, where they can turn to for ready-made uh, things to say, well, we needed these things, we had these things, it wouldn't have happened the way it happened. Um, so uh, I think that all that played into it and uh, you're right, we've gone down a path that has uh, gotten worse and worse. I don't think the, the, the bill is the reason for it getting worse and worse. I think the technology is the reason. I think the capacity of government to gather information and gather it so easily uh, that is simply not thwarted by current laws that uh, is the biggest part of the problem uh, that we have to address. And what a great opportunity to address it when you have a important provision that the intelligence community and administration after administration believes must be reauthorized. Therefore, uh, why not fix a lot of things at the time you reauthorize? 
Well, this will certainly, I think 2023 will certainly be one of the last opportunities. Uh, those of us who are concerned about these issues are likely going to have for the foreseeable future. You know, when the Patriot Act was originally enacted, as I'm sure Bob remembers, there were 16 provisions that actually had sunsets attached with them. Today, that number is zero. Uh, three of those provisions were allowed to expire just over three years ago, and those three provisions had never been used uh, to any degree that I'm aware of, which I think, again, just underscores the point that you were making a moment ago, Bob, that uh, a lot of stuff on the shelf uh, that folks thought they would necessarily need, they, they really didn't. Uh, one of the other things, of course, that happens in this period of time that none of us learn about uh, until literally years later is that even as the Bush administration was negotiating uh, with the House and the Senate over the provisions of the Patriot Act, uh, NSA Director uh, General Michael Hayden had already put in motion a particular program. Uh, we would not learn about this for years. I'm going to engage in some screen sharing here in order to help our audience understand uh, what we're talking about. Um, this is a, uh, a screenshot that you have here. It's actually um, the actual document itself. This is an NSA Inspector General draft report that was subsequently provided by Edward Snowden to the Guardian newspaper, and I believe also the New York Times. Uh, and this was published by the Guardian on, on June 27th, 2013. So this has actually been in the public domain for almost a decade. But in my experience, a lot of folks don't remember this one. This gets into some detail, essentially, about the very early days of when this super secret program, uh, which ultimately got the code name Stellar Wind, was put in train by uh, Director Hayden. And, you know, in the wake of this attack, it's very understandable why uh, Director Hayden and others, uh, Director Mueller and, and people at the very senior levels of our government would want to try to take advantage of whatever tools we had available in order to actually effectuate uh, surveillance that would potentially detect any other sleeper cells or other attacks that might be in the offing that had been missed the first time around. Um, this gets into some detail here uh, about, you know, what, what General Hayden did. And initially, he was just going after having NSA just go after numbers that were telephone numbers, essentially, that were originating out of Afghanistan. But by late September, he had made the switch to basically have NSA go after any Afghan telephone number in contact with a U.S. telephone number. And I'd be willing to bet that they wound up collecting data uh, on Americans in that period of time that had absolutely nothing to do with the attacks themselves. And it's the second paragraph that I really would like our panel to kind of talk about and focus on a little bit here, because uh, the IG uh, basically says that, you know, this was a quote, uh, or th they said that the NSA uh, Office of General Counsel had said that Hayden's action was, was a lawful exercise under Executive Order 12333, which is the overarching executive order governing kind of the day-to-day -day activities in the U.S. intelligence community. But they also admit, and I'll quote now, the targeting of communication links with one end in the United States was a more aggressive use of EO 12333 authority than, than that exercised by former directors. Liza, I, I want to uh, turn to you and just ask, um, was, was this actually lawful at the time General Hayden did it? Because it's, it's you know, my recollection that FISA was literally uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act enacted in 1978 was the sole authority for the collection of, of uh, electronic surveillance. So what, was this a lawful exercise? No, it, it wasn't lawful. And the question of whether or not it was permitted under Executive Order 12333 is sort of beside the point, because EO 12333 very clearly says that if any statute, including FISA, controls uh, the collection of information, then that is uh, then that trumps essentially any other provisions in EO 12333. FISA itself also said that that FISA was the exclusive means by which the government could conduct electronic surveillance, um, which is what was happening in this program. And so there's no question that that it violated the law. I think there were some there were some memos that the Department of Justice put out to say, well, the AUMF released us from FISA. It didn't. <laughs> I mean, it's such a stretch to even posit that argument. And so uh, it was unlawful when the government, uh, when, when the program became public, uh, the government tried to get the FISA court to approve it. And the FISA court basically said, we can't approve that because it violates FISA. And that's why the government ultimately turned to Congress and asked Congress to codify a version of the program 
uh, in what ultimately became Section 702 of FISA. Jake, do you concur with, with Liza's assessment? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think a very disturbing trend we see through a bunch of different surveillance programs at this um, period is spy first and ask forgiveness later. Um, and that's true, I think, of bulk collection. It's true a lot of the practices um, and activities we see now under um, FISA Section 702. Um, there is a pattern of trying to sort of push these authorities to the edge of what's permissible and quite often um, you know, not going to courts, not going to Congress to see what actually is approved and just hoping that it stays within the edge when actually it's gone a little or sometimes way over it. Bob, when did you learn of this? Did you learn when the rest of us did, when the New York Times published this story, or did you or any of your colleagues have an inkling that this might have you know, been going on? I did. I learned when it was uh, made public. Uh, the, the important question is, why doesn't Congress have a better mechanism for having more members of Congress informed? One would guess, and it's just a guess, uh, that uh, the so-called uh, group of eight, uh, which are the speaker and uh, minority leader and the intelligence committee chair and ranking member in the House and their counterparts in the Senate, have uh, uh, access to this information. But even other members of the intelligence committee often don't. Uh, get uh, read in on these. So I think as a part of 702 reform, it's really vital that the Congress write some stronger rules of the road uh, that says that if uh, under an executive order of any kind, whether it's 12 triple three or some new invention, uh, something is done, uh, that there has to be a greater mechanism for sharing that information uh, with the Congress. Uh, and of course, what you really want to have uh, is Congress's approval. That gets into uh, issues regarding separation of powers because the president is the commander in chief and under certain circumstances, uh, he could and would be expected to take action that the Congress wouldn't be involved with. But these are long ongoing programs that do not involve war in the traditional sense of war and are uh, done in such a way that um, Americans' rights uh, under the Fourth Amendment are violated constantly, all day, every day. Uh, and therefore, Congress, you know, as, as we take this up, needs to put uh, some real framework around the use of uh, executive orders by presidents. And I also think Congress needs to change its own rules to make sure that every member of Congress, uh, all of whom have security clearance, have at least one staff member uh, who uh, has a TSSCI uh, security clearance as well, because the way oversight is done in the Congress is, yes, members take a keen interest in it, uh, but staff and staff communicating with other staff are the ones who put together hearings that uh, uh, read in-depth uh, documents and so on. But when you're talking about something uh, that's classified, it means individual members have to go over to a skiff at the Intelligence Committee. Uh, I actually built a skip when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee so that I could uh, get uh, more easily uh, access to documents coming over from uh, the intelligence community and the FBI and the Justice Department. And other members of my committee uh, could uh, uh, more easily read those, but their staff still couldn't. I had uh, several staff members as chairman uh, who had security clearance, but most members of Congress do not have any staff and therefore have very little ability to conduct oversight of what's going on in the executive branch. That needs to change. It's really critical in my opinion. Information inside of Washington, DC is the coin of the realm, as they say. And uh, the proposal you put forward is of course, something that um, our, friend, um, our friends over at Demand Progress um, have been uh, basically asking for. Daniel Schumann has been uh, lobbying tirelessly uh, for the very kind of authority that you're talking about. Uh, and based on my personal experience, I don't think there's any question uh, that that would be helpful. Um, but at the same time, and as I've made the observation before, um, nothing nothing shakes up the system like a member who's really determined, you know, to do something about it. And and staff can, uh, staff can suggest, staff can plead, but staff aren't elected and staff don't vote. Uh, but and staff the, empower the member. The member doesn't know what to ask for unless the staff have been able 
to dig and dig and dig and find those gems. Uh, that's what good uh, oversight hearings in any committee uh, are made of. Lots of advanced groundwork, uh, information coming in from outside, uh, reading documents, demanding documents, and looking at them. All of that can be done at the staff level. You're right, to drive it to the next level, uh, you have to have members dedicated to doing that. But the members who are dedicated to doing that aren't read in even under the current set of circumstances because uh, it's generally uh, viewed as okay to limit access to information to a select few in the Congress. Uh, that is not, in my opinion, appropriate oversight. And that, that's also a condition that the federal agencies that we're talking about really try to go out of their way to enforce. Um, uh, CIA, uh, NSA, uh, DOJ generally uh, are very interested in trying to limit the number of members who actually get access to much of anything. So you I bet. think I think your point is extremely well taken in that respect. So we have been talking about this authority, uh, FISA Amendments Act, Section 702. There was an interim uh, piece of legislation called the Protect America Act um, that I think was kind of obliquely referenced by Liza a minute ago. Um, that really had no teeth to it whatsoever. There was enough of a revolt um, that that actually expired for a while. But the negotiations finally produced this thing that we have today called the FISA Amendments Act, uh, and specifically Section 702. So uh, what exactly does FISA Section 702 do for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with it? Who'd like to lead sure. off with that? Yeah, I'd love to answer that. Um, I just want to say the Protect America Act, when you say it had no teeth, I think what you, I assume what you meant is that it didn't have sufficient privacy protections because um, yes. that, that was absolutely the case. Uh, and then so then a year later, uh, Congress replaced it with Section 702, uh, which was passed for the ostensible purpose of giving the government greater power to go after foreign terrorists. And the law allows the government to target any foreigner overseas and to collect all of their communications, including with Americans, without having to obtain any individualized order from the FISA court. The only substantive restriction is that a significant purpose of the collection has to be acquisition of foreign intelligence, which is defined extremely broadly to include any information that relates to the conduct of US foreign affairs. The FISA court signs off on general procedures on an annual basis, but it has no role in approving individual targets. Even though Section 702 has to be targeted at foreigners abroad, it inevitably sweeps in huge volumes of Americans' communications, probably millions every year, uh, because Americans communicate with foreigners. If the government's purpose, and this is key, were to eavesdrop on those Americans, it would have to get either a warrant in a criminal investigation or a FISA Title I order in a foreign intelligence investigation. That's an order that the FISA court issues on a showing of probable cause that the target is an agent of a foreign power. So to prevent Section 702 from being used as an end run around these protections, Congress did two things. It required the government to minimize the collection, sharing, and retention of US person information, Americans incidentally communicate, uh, collected communications. And it required the government to certify to the FISA court on an annual basis that it is not using section 702 to try to access the communications of particular known Americans. What has become abundantly clear over the last 15 years is that these protections are not working. All agencies that receive section 702 data have procedures in place approved by the FISA court that allow them to run electronic searches of the information collected under Section 702 for the purpose of finding and retrieving the phone calls, text messages, and emails of Americans. So having obtained all of this information without a warrant, based on a certification that it isn't seeking access to the communications of particular known Americans, the government then goes rummaging through the data looking for the communications of particular known Americans. Um, agencies can conduct these uh, backdoor searches, as they're called, uh, in investigations that have absolutely nothing to do with the original surveillance. The FBI uh, routinely conducts these queries at the assessment stage of its investigations, which is before the agency had the, the Bureau has a reasonable factual basis to suspect criminal activity, let alone probable cause and a warrant. 
The FBI conducted around 200,000 backdoor searches in 2022 alone. So that's more than 500 warrantless searches for Americans' communications every day. The NSA and CIA also conduct thousands of backdoor searches every year. So when you look at these numbers, uh, it becomes very clear that what was supposed to be a solely foreign-focused authority has, in fact, become a very powerful domestic spying tool. And that is why, or that's one of the reasons why, probably the main reason, Section 702 has become so controversial and why uh, advocates like myself are uh, opposing any reauthorization uh, in the absence of really sweeping reforms. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have a major explainer piece on FISA Section 702 up on the web today. What is the outlet that that is appearing in so folks can go and look for that? Thank you. It's Foreign Affairs. So, um, so that, that's how today. Mm-hmm. So go over to Foreign Affairs uh, either now or uh, when we're done here and take a look uh, at what uh, Liza has written. I'm pretty sure it's probably a four or 5,000 uh, word piece, more than likely. with so an fast awful- read. Yeah, yeah, really fast read there. Jake, uh, Liza has mentioned these violations. Um, they have been epic in scale. From your perspective over at CDT, what kind of reforms do you think, number one, can the program be reformed? Let me start with that. Can it actually be reformed? And and if you believe that it can, what should that reform look like? Um, so I'll, I'll go backwards and take the first first part. Um, I mean, I think that the, the violations we've seen have not just been epic in scale, but they've also been persistent over and over again. I mean, this really is kind of the groundhog's day of surveillance issues. We see a series of violations. The FBI says, we're putting in new rules. We're doing new training. The FISA court says, okay, we'll approve these new procedures. Come back. We see a whole new host of violations. The FBI says, we're putting in new rules, new training. FISA court says, yes. And yet again, just a few weeks ago, we've seen the latest round of this sort of groundhog's day of surveillance of a whole litany of compliance violations and abuse. And to kind of put a, a human scale on this, I mean, we're, we're talking about are not just kind of random, um, you know, typos or wrong clicks or incidents. Um, we're looking at things like pulling up batches of thousands of political donors in one go without any suspicion of wrongdoing. Hundreds of Black Lives Matter protesters being queried without, um, you know, any expectation that's going to turn up foreign intelligence information. We've had prior reports of journalists, political commentators, a local political party. This is what we're talking about when we talk about these compliance violations. The most kind of worrisome type of politically focused um, surveillance or surveillance focused at dissidents and marginalized groups. Um, so really the, the recipe for abuse is right there. And the type of self-policing we've seen just simply does not work. It's creating this sort of vicious cycle of just, um, you know, violate rules, tweak rules, repeat. Um, I do think that 702 can be reformed, but the way we do this, we need to remove it from this realm of self-policing and actually have independent oversight and approval, not on the general level of, okay, these are the type of rules that you can self-police um, for the agencies, but actually having items like a warrant rule where if the FBI or NSA or CIA wants to conduct a query to pull up Americans' communications, it has to get court approval first. Um, now, that's just one of many reforms. Um, Liza discussed the idea that this really can just target any foreign or abroad practically. I think we need to narrow that down and actually have um, targeting be based on trying to get information related to security threats rather than that sort of catch-all of the conduct of foreign affairs. Um, I think we need to give the FISA court um, a little more weight behind it through actions like improving the role of the special advocate, which is, I think, one of the most um, the biggest successes of the USA Freedom Act was creating that amici role. I think we need to bring them into more proceedings and ensure they have access to more materials. Um, so through measures like that, I, I think we hopefully can actually put 702 in a place where it's pop- properly regulated. But I think kind of the big takeaways, like another other areas of surveillance, it's dependent on independent oversight and approval. We cannot have a regime where the people doing the watching are also watching themselves for um, abuse and misconduct. We've just seen again and again that that does not work fundamentally. Yeah, we're we're getting uh, a lot of really good questions here. Some of them um, I I want to get to if if we possibly can um, that actually have to do with concerns about medical privacy and potentially medical surveillance. But I want to put a hold on those questions for just a moment because we just got one from uh, an anonymous individual 
asking, are algorithms attached to FISA Section 702 surveillance? Do we know that? Do we, do we know what the status of that is? I don't know, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me if the intelligence community didn't use a lot of technology to sort through the billions of pieces of data that uh, flows past them uh, every hour. And uh, exactly how that works, I don't know. But it certainly wouldn't surprise me that they use technology to sort through. Uh, obviously, word searches are done, but how the word searches are conducted and how you put one word together with another word Right. Uh, come up with uh, information uh, is, I'm sure, classified information that uh, I never, I never heard about while I was in Congress. But I've always believed that in recent times, when that technology was available, when people started using uh, <clears throat> the word algorithms uh, to uh, conduct search, that uh, the intelligence community would have to be on the leading edge of that. Liza, Jake, any in insights on that particular question of algorithms and a connection to 702 usage? I would imagine that algor algorithms could conceivably also be used to, to try to uh, assist the government in determining whom to target in the first instance and maybe, um, you know, whom to, to, to query in U.S. person queries. I mean, I, I, I'm... I'm speculating because algorithms are used for everything. Um, but as Bob said, a lot of this information is heavily classified. And when you look at the FISA court opinions, uh, some of the pages that have the biggest black boxes on them where everything has been redacted are ones that talk about methods of collection uh, and sort of methods in general. And so that is not something that the public would have any insight into. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point about, you know, the potential for um algorithms in, in targeting procedures. I mean, one, one just other technical point I'll raise is there's two types of 702 collection, um, one called um, downstream, it was originally called PRISM during the Snowden revelations, where basically um, the NSA will go to Google, Microsoft, Apple, other US um, communications providers and say, here's our 702 targets, give us their emails and communications. The other method, which is called upstream, basically involves the NSA um, working with companies or acting on its own, to attach the ability to scan the backbone of the internet, the mainline cables that go in and out of the United States just outside of them and scan for content. So in that case, you know, it would scan through all the incoming and outgoing internet traffic to say, pull up any um, emails we get from, you know, Vlad at Putin.com or, you know, whoever else your section of 702 target is. And that's an area where in the past we've seen, um, because it's just a lot less precise, a lot more potential for over collection and errors. So to kind of get to some of the questions that I'm seeing here uh, coming in uh, online from folks, if an American citizen were overseas uh, and needed to conduct, uh, let's say on vacation or in business, you know, take your pick, and they needed to conduct a telemedicine appointment with their provider back in the United States, that's exactly the kind of data that could get swept up in this program. Yes no. or no? No, not not if you not if it's an American overseas. The only permissible targets are foreigners abroad. The way Americans communications get swept up is because foreigners communicate with Americans. And then there's some amount of accidental collection of just purely domestic uh, communications. But but the sort of allowable collection is between foreigners overseas and Americans. There's a specific provision of of uh, FISA that governs uh, the collection of communications of Americans when they are the targets, when they are overseas. And that does require a FISA court order. So that is not is not so much the issue. However, um, it is certainly uh, possible for an American to be speaking with a relative overseas about a medical condition that they have, for instance. And if that person is one of the 200,000 plus current targets under Section 702, and that number grows significantly every year, um, then, then the, the fact that this is private medical information would not somehow render it off limits for Section 702 collection. Liza, while we're on the subject of medical information, uh, is there anything that would prohibit an intelligence agency from buying that data? No, there's absolutely nothing that would prohibit it. Now, there, there are some rules under under HIPAA that there's a lot of, HIPAA has a lot of words in it. It's basically health information privacy. 
Protection Act. Oh, I think I got it. Anyway, there, there are some restrictions there on what healthcare providers can share and for what reasons. However, there are a lot of gaps and loopholes in that law. So healthcare providers, the definition doesn't include, for example, certain apps that might track health information. Um, and it also, the prohibitions of HIPAA only apply to personally identifiable information. As we know now, anonymized, so-called anonymized information can often be re-identified fairly easily. So all of this health data can find its way into the hands of data brokers. And the government, there are absolutely no limitations right now on the government's ability to purchase and make use of that information from data brokers, even if the law would prevent the healthcare provider from disseminating that very same information to the government. It's probably worth uh, observing that um, the senior senator from Oregon, uh, Senator Ron Wyden, has for several years now had legislation out there designed to try to um, make that problem go away, shall we say, uh, get a warrant requirement against it. It would certainly seem to me um, if there's any leverage that he can exert here to potentially force that into the equation of, of a potential reform to 702. That would certainly- well, I think, I hate to interrupt, but I, I think that should be a critical piece of any 702 reform legislation that's coming up this year because 702 is expiring. And if it's allowed to expire, as some people think that's a, that'd be a great idea, I don't. And the reason I don't is because uh, you have executive orders and you have the ability to purchase data. And these workarounds uh, are major ways around the Fourth Amendment protection that people uh, should have. Uh, and therefore, if you're going to uh, allow 702 to continue, you should require these things. And if you just let it expire, you won't get any of these things. And I think it's, yeah, Jake, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just tack on to that real quick. I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said. And I think one other similar element to note is that um, you know, for the idea of especially Americans abroad, a lot of surveillance that occurs under executive order um, 12333, that's 12333, this is the executive's kind of unilateral surveillance activities they conduct abroad. A lot of that can be bulk collection and bulk surveillance activities that are not targeted Americans because there's limits on that but will sweep up Americans abroad. So um, programs that gather location information on mask or the content of text messages on mask. If you were say, you know, at a, a hospital abroad and your phone is indicating that you're there, um, that might get swept up. And in the same way that um, what Congressman Goodlett's discussing about, you know, we, we can't kind of have this surveillance whack-a-mole where we move away from 702 and then just the data purchases. I think we, all three of us very much worry similarly about that happening with executive order 12333. Um, so yeah, I think both of those are areas where um, we need to make sure we address them along with 702. So surveillance actually is limited as opposed to simply moved. And if I could say just a little bit more about EO 12333, uh, EO 12333 generally applies when the government conducts surveillance overseas, whereas FISA usually applies when the government is conducting its surveillance, when it's collecting the information inside the United States or from uh, U.S.-based companies, uh, EO 12333 has far fewer protections for Americans' privacy, and it involves no judicial oversight whatsoever. Now, the government cannot target an American under EO 12333, but as Jake was saying, uh, when the government's engaged in bulk collection, that doesn't matter. And second, even if the government is targeting foreigners overseas under EO 12333, that results in the incidental collection of enormous volumes of Americans' information and communications, just like Section 702 does. But the protections of 702, as inadequate as they are, don't even apply when that happens under EO 12333. The government can and does conduct backdoor searches of information it collects under EO 12333, and there are no court-ordered procedures involved, no judicial oversight whatsoever. So reforms of Section 702 uh, would be sort of pointless if the government can do all of the same things under EO 12333. And once once this data is acquired, essentially, the, the government's position has consistently been that once the information is so-called lawfully acquired under Section 702, that information can be used for any lawful purpose and thus no warrant is required. So at the end of the day, you know, they're like, what's the problem? So what is the problem? Well, the idea that it can be used for any lawful purpose is literally the opposite of minimization. And minimization is not only a statutory requirement, 
it's a constitutional requirement as well. And the FISA court has said that. So the, the thing that makes a collection lawful in the first place is the certification that this is not being used uh, for, for free access to Americans' uh, communication. So whatever truth that kind of statement might have in other contexts, it, it sort of flies in the face of the constitutional and statutory grounding for Section 702. And, and frankly, there are plenty of other contexts where I know it's also not the case. If you look at the Supreme Court's holding uh, in Riley versus California, uh, the court held that even if the police have lawfully acquired a person's cell phone uh, pursuant to a search incident to arrest, they still have to go get a warrant in order to, to search the contents of that phone because that search has a different purpose and it's a, it's a different intrusion. And the, the same is clearly the case for a, for a backdoor search. So it, it's um, that statement simply doesn't hold up um, when it comes to Section 702 or, frankly, a lot of other areas as well. You know, one of the, uh, Jake, I think you might have had something. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, that's very much right. And I think another aspect to think about for this is that, you know, for 702 and as a corollary um, executive order 12, triple three and data purchases where we think the same fix is needed, um, you know, these are very unique instances of you have an American's communications that you got without a warrant. Um, you know, when we look at these other scenarios, we're saying like, oh, like, you know, if I was talking to Tony Soprano on the phone and now the FBI wants to read through my communications and happens to have them, sure, they got that without a warrant on me, but they still went to court in the first place and got the warrant on Tony Soprano. There was still oversight at the outset to make sure it was not phishing, that it was proper. Um, that, you know, occurs in pretty much every other context except for 702 and these other areas that we think the loophole similarly need to be closed. I mean, there, there's some exceptions, emergencies, although you still have to go to a court after an emergency, um, after the fact to verify. But we're talking about what are basically the exceptions to the rule of, if you're going to get an American's private communications, you have to go through a court first. Um, 702 and these other programs that we need similar fixes on, they are the outlier. They are not the norm. Now, our friends uh, in the executive branch have repeatedly also made the point that they use U.S. person queries to try to identify potential victims or targets, let's say, of foreign cyber attacks, espionage, influence ops, and that any kind of you know, probable cause-based warrant requirement would make that impossible. That doesn't pass the smell test to me, but I'm prepared to be wrong if anybody here can, can convince me otherwise. I'm not going to try that. <laughs> I completely agree with you. It smells very fishy to me. The other, yeah. two, the other two of you would concur, I take it? Yeah, and just to kind of elaborate a little bit on why. Um, so let's take the kind of the first, the victim, the cyber victim example, and then the sort of, oh, we need to check for foreign influence example. Um, for the victim example, there's already a path to doing this. And as far as I understand, the FBI does this domestically with cyber victims. Um, Title three wiretaps, they do not require that you put in the name of, you know, an individual and show probable cause that that person committed a crime, you need probable cause that the communication that you are going to monitor will reveal evidence of a specific crime. So in this case, you know, if you need to pull up the information of a victim because it's going to show that they are being targeted or a cyber attacks being carried out against them, you just have to show probable cause that it's going to provide that real information. That would require the warrant. That would meet the requirements for the warrant that we're all saying should be put into place in those. So um, it is very much, you know, I think I'm misreading to say, oh, well, it, the victim didn't commit the crime, so we can't get probable cause there. Um, there is a path for that through the Title III method. Um, on this idea of looking at, you know, foreign influence operations, um, I think that's something to be very, very wary of because um, this is something that we've seen as the excuse for some of the worst surveillance abuses throughout history. Um, the monitoring of Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders in the 60s. That was done because ostensibly communists and foreign influences were trying to get at them. That was the excuse that was made for that monitoring. Um, the COINTELPRO surveillance activities that were targeted at activists, anti the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s, that was all justified under the ostensible reason of we need to guard against foreign influence. We're worried about foreign influence on these activists and these organizers. Um, after 9-11, surveillance of Muslim communities in New York and other areas, that was pushed under the ostensible reason of, well, we're worried about Al-Qaeda and foreign influences and foreign terrorist groups infiltrating and conducting radicalization of these communities. Um, so I think it's, it's just, it really should highlight that 
you know, some of the worst surveillance abuses in recent history have all been done under this idea of defensive surveillance. And we should be very wary of that. You know, hey, you can't put checks on that because it's fine. It's it's proven to be some of the most vulnerable type of surveillance for abuse. Um, and again, I think, you know, even if you have a legitimate situation where we need to monitor, you know, conduct monitoring conduct activities and we're not saying that you're cut off that the fbi can't conduct queries that the nsa and cia can't conduct queries it's that you have to show probable cause so don't just say oh we want to monitor this person because we're worried about foreign influence provide actual evidence and reasoning that there is a there there that there is a basis and then do it on a limited scale that's why we want the court there is to act as a check against abuse not to recreate the wall that um congressman Gillette was talking about originally and shut the idea of access to information entirely but show that there's actual reasonable predicate there and do it on a reasonably limited scale. And Jake, and I, what you just mentioned leads to another important reform that I need to, I think needs to be added to any section 702 reform. And that is one of the criticisms here is that <clears throat> the law enforcement agency, the FBI, <clears throat> whoever uh, goes in to a courtroom where the only other party there is the judge. Uh, Obviously, when you're dealing with a suspected terrorist, the terrorist is not entitled to counsel uh, before that court. But I think the American people are entitled to counsel before that court, and therefore an expanded amici program, particularly in the areas that Jake described when you're talking about um, political campaigns, elected officials, uh, religious organizations, uh, civil rights organizations, all of those uh, should have a provision in the law that triggers a uh, requirement that judge make a finding whether or not they're going to have an amici and then an amici, someone with security clearance, but who's there <clears throat> to protect the interests of the public and protect the Fourth Amendment, if you will, uh, in the courtroom and able to raise the right questions and make the right points that are simply not there now under current circumstances, even when they do go and get a warrant, as they did in the Carter Page case. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Bob, because I, I've been really, quite frankly, very angry at the New York Times and some of these other outlets that have tried to basically downplay the significance of what uh, uh, Special Counsel Durham found uh, in the course of his investigation. There was an awful lot more in there, quite frankly, uh, in terms of extremely important detail about just how far off the rails they were as compared to uh, DOJ IG Horowitz's report, and I'm not knocking uh, uh, Mr. Horowitz and his team. I think they did a very good job. But um, what I was absolutely flabbergasted by, and, and for me, this gets back to this whole issue of how standards have been lowered, is that it was clear that the kind of bias that, um, uh, that Durham talked about wasn't just the anti-Trump bias of people like uh, you know Lisa Page and, and Peter Strozik. But what I found very disturbing is just this reflexive bias in favor of what this Australian, you know, diplomatic hearsay uh, was essentially, you know, claiming about what was going on there. And, and what Durham found, and again, I found this just flabbergasting, is that apparently no one uh, in the FBI or the National Security Division at DOJ thought it would be a good idea to go to NSA and CIA and ask them, hey, by the way, do you have anything that would corroborate this? Um, when, when we see the lowering of those kinds of standards, and when you're talking about an investigation that targeted the campaign of, of, of a presidential candidate, if they were that sloppy there, then how much more sloppy are they being with folks that don't have the kind of power and influence that Donald Trump does, for example, or Hillary Clinton does, for that matter? So I think that's one of the other things that I'm very deeply concerned about. And you all have raised... Um, a number of questions, essentially, not just about the kinds of reforms that, that we should, and suggestions, I should say, about the kinds of reforms that we ought to see here in 702. But there's been a lot of talk about Executive Order 12333. And, and I think that brings me, you know, to my, maybe my most important question. Do we see any prospect this year of being able to get anything above and beyond some of these FISA Section 702 reforms? Is there enough leverage, essentially, to try to address some of these other uh, uh, surveillance activities that are clearly way beyond any kind of guardrails. And I'll just open that up to, to all of you. I'll be happy to go first. Uh, I, I think that this is a tremendous opportunity because of the heightened awareness 
on both sides of the aisle in the Congress of these abuses. Um, there has been good work done by the Justice Department Inspector General, uh, by uh, some aspects of the P Club's work, by some judges in the FISA court who have gone out of their way to make sure some information that ordinarily is just never seen by anybody uh, has been made available. Uh, I think it's just the tip of the iceberg myself, but be that as it may, uh, Congress is aware the Congress can act in a very bipartisan way uh, and I think is disposed to act in a very bipartisan way. The two hearings on these subjects they have in, in the House Judiciary Committee last year, one on the Fourth Amendment's Not for Sale Act, and just a couple of weeks ago on 702 reauthorization, were both very bipartisan. And I think that if the committee undertook to take up reform, not just of 702, which is badly needed in and of itself, but all of these other things that we've talked about, uh, amici in the FISA court, um, the pro prohibition of purchasing of data by government agencies without uh, a proper court order, uh, and offense around what presidents can do with executive orders are all critically important. And I think all would enjoy um, overwhelming success, starting in the House Judiciary Committee, moving uh, to the full House of Representatives. And at the end of the day, I think then you have the kind of leverage to say, okay, you want 702 reauthorized. Uh, there's lots of controversy about that, but we've made some fixes here uh, and we're going to extend it. I would ex I would have another sunset. I wouldn't extend it indefinitely. Uh, but I think then you have a situation where the Senate, I think, very well could come uh, come up with 60 votes in favor of the same thing. Uh, and then uh, it would be probably even a veto proof majority that the president would need to sign. This is this is a very rare opportunity because of the leverage of 702 expiration. And it's very important uh, that these kinds of reforms be done uh, and that it be done in a bipartisan way. Uh, these abuses have taken place in administrations of both parties. Uh, and it's time to exercise rare leverage to really have the Congress assert itself. Liza, Jake? I really couldn't say it any better. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd concur and just say, I, I think that kind of going beyond 702 is not just possible, but I think it's essential. There's a lot of members, um, you know, especially in the House that are fed up with all the problems that we've been discussing throughout the last hour, um, you know, and kind of are just inclined to say, let's just let it expire. Um, and I think to kind of, to win a lot of those members over, um, it's not going to be enough to say, well, we'll reform 702, we'll change 702. I think um, it's important to have that message that we've been saying of, look, we can't play surveillance whack-a-mole. Um, we need to make these changes. If we have a bill that goes beyond 702 and says, well, these are items that we're not going to fix if we just let it sunset, no matter how much you think reforms are good or not enough. This goes, you know, dealing with data purchase, dealing with executive order 12333, dealing with improving fundamentals of the FISA accord and strengthening the amici, things like that. These are items that we don't get if we have a sunset. This is ways that we go beyond just 702. I think that's actually going to be a selling point that'll actually help us get to that type of strong bipartisan consensus that um, Congressman Goodlett's talking about. You know, last Bob, thing I said is it won't end with this, Patrick. Eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was uh, absolutely true. And and uh, you know what I was going to basically ask Bob is uh, some of you probably well most of you probably don't know that. Bob and I had a previous discussion about whether or not the speaker would survive the <laughs> the debt ceiling, uh, uh, looming debt ceiling uh, uh, expiration, and he did. He managed to uh, manage to thread that needle. He's got some folks that uh, on his right flank that are rather upset with him, but he managed to do it. And the reason I bring it up is because uh, Speaker McCarthy and Leader Scalise have repeatedly, you know, supported 702 reauthorization. Do you think, and I'm asking you to speculate, and I understand that, um, and I certainly don't want you to divulge any private conversations that you might have had with either the speaker or, or the leader, but um, do you think that they are getting the message, and, and do you think that they'll actually ultimately be on board for some of the kinds of reforms that we've been talking about for the last hour or so? Well, this is speculation, but I do believe uh, that their eyes are very open as they proceed. They have a narrow majority. They have an opportunity to pass legislation with strong bipartisan support, and uh, they have an opportunity to please some of those same people who were critics 
uh, of uh, not getting enough on the debt ceiling, I think I think the speaker did a, an incredible job of threading that needle. Uh, I think in this case, um, he will be very open to addressing reform because people uh, across the board are going to be demanding it. And he's he's a responsive speaker. Well, um, we have had, you know, a large number, I will say, of questions um, uh, coming in from the audience. Uh, again, a lot of those have actually been about medical privacy, which I really find very interesting. And that also tells me that that may be an event that we ought to be thinking about doing here at the Cato Institute. Um, we have certainly done it on banking surveillance. We're doing it now uh, on this specific uh, authority used by NSA, the FBI, and other components of federal law enforcement and the intelligence community. Uh, so if, if we have been unable to get to some of those questions today, um, please know that uh, we have heard you, uh, we understand the interest, and we will certainly investigate having uh, uh, an event like that down the line. Um, I just want to take the last you know, couple of minutes uh, to give you all the opportunity to offer some, uh, some closing thoughts. Who would like to tee off? Well, I just want to thank uh, the Cato Institute for uh, organizing this. And I want to thank Liza and Jake for uh, their contribution. They really know the nuts and bolts of surveillance law. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of respect for both of them. So I thank them for uh, participating uh, and letting your uh, audience share in some real knowledge about um, what the problem is and what can be done about it. Wholeheartedly agree. I guess I would add to that that Section 702 um, on one level is an incredibly technical and complicated bill. And I think the government uses that to its advantage. Um, yeah. if, if we get lost in a conversation about technical details of different provisions of the bill, we're missing a big picture. What Section 702 is being used for right now is not complicated at all. It's being used to provide warrantless access to Americans' communications. That is the principle that we need to hang on to, that surveillance in this country, surveillance of Americans should be pursuant to a, a warrant. It should be pursuant to statutory authority, which it's not under Executive Order 12333. And there should be robust mechanisms in place to ensure accountability uh, and oversight. And I think as long as we keep our, our eye on those big principles and don't get lost in the legal weeds, um, I think we're going to end up with a, with a pretty good outcome. Jake, last word. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, I'll echo what everyone said. That's, you know, um, a lot of gratitude to our Great co-panels here and uh, you, Patrick and Cato, for facilitating a really fantastic discussion. Um, I guess I'll just close out by saying, you know, um, I think this is an issue it's it's really important to stay engaged on. Um, this is the rare issue in, in Congress. We talk about a lot of important items, but we never really know when or if they're going to come up for a vote. We know that, you know, this is the one thing guaranteed this year that Congress um, will do something on. Either they're going to pass some sort of legislation around Section 702 or they're going to allow Section 702 to expire. Um, so really, um, I think we have a really, really valuable opportunity um, to take this on, and we know we kind of have the, the means to do it this year and hopefully get a really um, great result, as Liza was just saying. So um, yeah, I would encourage everyone who's listening now to um, to stay engaged um, you know, in the news, stay engaged with your member of Congress, and, and keep working, because I think we can really actually make a positive change here. And, and let me just add my thanks, not not just to uh, to Cato and Pat uh, and also Jake and Congressman Goodlatte, but also to all of you who, for coming in and watching this event today. I think being engaged on this issue, that's really half the battle, more than half the battle. And so uh, very grateful for your um, for your attendance and your interest. And my thanks to each of you, Jake LaPeruk, Liza Godian, Representative Bob Goodlatte, so much for carving out the time to be with us today. My thanks to you, our viewers and our, our listeners. And just a reminder that Cato Surveillance Week 2023 continues tomorrow, where we will be discussing the issue of domestic terrorism versus free speech. Uh, we have a great panel lined up for that. Again, we'll be starting at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So I hope you'll join us then. Until then, for the Cato Institute, I'm Patrick Eddington. Thanks for watching.